As countries around the world begin to ease their coronavirus restrictions, a lot of people are wondering whether or not we'll go back to the way life was and the world was before the coronavirus. So we want to bring in Peter Engelke. Peter, you are the deputy director and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And we're not talking about, you know, life in the U.S., your day-to-day -day life, but we're talking about, you know, the world and the U.S. on the world stage. So the relationship between U.S. and China on the world stage was, I don't think it could be, it could be um, categorized as being uh, particularly positive. Um, you know, the U.S. and China have been in an ongoing uh, spat over trade and, and uh, the rules surrounding trade for quite some time. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, I think was and still is a rising concern in uh, Washington-based foreign policy circles about what China's intentions are on the global stage and uh, whether or not China is going to um, uh, become a full partner in the sort of the internet within the international system or whether or not it will turn into a, a rival uh, to the United States and, and possibly even into, eventually into an adversary. And so that was that was where the U.S. China relationship was, I would say, before the pandemic uh, struck. So I think the question now is, how has that is that how is the pandemic changing uh, that relationship looking forward how might it change that uh let me ask you about the credibility of the united states around the world uh how has the u.s response to uh, the coronavirus pandemic impacted the credibility of this country uh and its perception uh perhaps that has existed, you know, for many, many years, perhaps going back to the initiation of the Marshall Plan um, as a global leader. Do other countries, and I don't mean, you know, Russia and, and China, I'm talking about our allies within NATO, for example, do they still see the United States as a global leader, one that is a reliable partner when it comes to attacking or taking on or confronting a crisis that is seen as a global threat? Right. So you're absolutely correct in that after the Second World War, the U.S. and its its partners at the time, mostly European, but also some East Asian partners and eventually expanding to, to many other parts of the world. Um, the U.S. led uh, an effort to build out of the rubble of the Second World War a set of institutions, a set of alliances um, uh, based around the premise that cooperating and coordinating is better than than uh, fighting one another. And that that world has benefited, the world that the U.S. led and created after the Second World War was to the enormous benefit of not only um, the rest of the world, but also to the United States itself. And, and historically, the U.S. has played this role, and uh, you're absolutely correct in that our allies and partners in Europe, in East Asia, in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, have looked to the United States for leadership um, consistently during the post-war period. The question, and I think you're, you're phrasing it the, the correct way, the question now is, is the U.S. still seen in that light? And I think that, that is, it, it is uh, framed appropriately. It is a question, as in, uh, are we still that reliable partner? I think the answer is right now, the world wants us to be that reliable partner. They, they want us to step up. They want us to lead. Uh, and the question is, will we do so? Um, Thus far, the United States is not doing particularly well when it comes to handling the pandemic in terms of number of cases, number of fatalities, sadly. Um, and, you know, not only are we going to be able to be looked at in terms of how we're going to uh, handle this problem going forward in terms of the uh, public health fallout, the economic fallout, but also critically the, um, you know, what are we going to be doing on the, on the foreign affairs front? Uh, and in my mind, it is a question. Uh, are we going to go uh, continue to go and bolster our uh, historic leadership position, or are we going to be going in another direction where we uh, do not uh, take up the mantle of leadership? To me, that is the central question that we face. Um, so that was almost sort of a conversation, I think, a little bit that was happening b even before the coronavirus, as, you know, President Trump continued to sort of um, push his America first agenda. And there was always a concern that where there's a vacuum, another country will slip in, particularly China. China had this major setback with the coronavirus, but they've turned the corner. And we find ourselves increasingly dependent on them, particularly for medical supplies. Is there a possibility that China really benefits from this? Sure. So there is, um, my, my co-author and I, for this Atlantic Council report that we just published, uh, which creates three scenarios. One of those scenarios is essentially a China first scenario. 
uh, where, where, where the outcome is, as you described, where China uh, recovers faster uh, and it manages to um, look better in, in, in the eyes of the world compared to the U.S. and its European historic uh, European allies. So that China, uh, its economic recovery is, is quicker than ours, uh, it, but also it goes um, on, a, on a foreign affairs uh, offensive, if you will, in terms of trying to tie other countries uh, closer into its orbit relative to what the U.S. And, and Europe are able to do, or I should say not able to do in, that, in this particular scenario, wherein we struggle economically, we, uh, Europe struggles economically, uh, and we don't step up to, um, to engage in our own, if you will, uh, offensive around cooperating and coordinating with other parts of the world. So yes, to answer your question, it is, it is entirely plausible that China may actually come out stronger relative to the United States um, than uh, before the pandemic, than before the pandemic pandemic hit. And that is a real risk. So I guess, Peter, uh, what's the most likely scenario here? Uh, is there a hope? I, and I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange question to ask, but I'm just trying to understand if uh, that you see that through the rubble, just as you pointed out after World War II and the rubble of that horrific war that took millions of lives, here we are once again faced with a global threat. Um, and a lot of it is going to depend on measures that are taken, uh, not just to ensure the safety and security of citizens in a, in a particular state or country, but to ensure the safety of citizens all around the world, because people travel and people uh, uh, move between borders. Uh, so how do you see it all playing out? And I guess the question becomes, uh, are you hopeful about that scenario? Well, I think we need to be hopeful at this time. I mean, there, I don't want to minimize what we're facing. There is almost no one left in, alive on, uh, on Earth who um, uh, survived or, or was alive, I should say, at, at the time of the last truly global pandemic, which was the Spanish flu of 1918-19. And, and none of those people, frankly, will remember it because they were, would have been very, very young. Um, it is, it is important to stay hopeful amidst all of this. Uh, and it's important to stay hopeful because although there is real downside risk that this pandemic is going to, to create a lot of economic dislocation, certainly the public health effects are, are um, severely consequential, including mortality. Um, and, and there is real geopolitical risk as well. And by geopolitical risk, I mean a fracturing of global alliances, a fracturing of global um, partnerships, and up to and including the possibility of, of conflict amongst major powers. Um, but uh, by the same token, the reason why we wrote our, our report, again, we have three scenarios of that in there. Two of those are negative, and one of, the, one of them is positive. And the positive one is a message that the Atlantic Council, my institution, um, consistently reinforces in, in, in everything we do because we believe in it, in it which is that um, cooperation is better than not cooperating. Cooperating is better than not cooperating. And uh, the, the world needs U.S. leadership. It needs leadership of the U.S. in concert with not only its allies and partners, again, historically, the, uh, Europe, historically, um, some East Asian countries and, and um, some in the, in the Pacific Basin and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, but also, it need, we need to be working alongside um, those countries that we don't necessarily define as allies, so we might even define as rivals, uh, including China in order to get to a more cooperative uh, world, future world, one in which not only are we, ad we addressing the sources of the pandemic, so for example, we're eliminating sources of future pandemic risk, but we're also beginning to address other kinds of, of real systematic risks in the international system, including, for example, climate change and other kinds of, of, of um, risks that we know are on the horizon and that we know are coming, but that, and that will require true coordinated efforts to solve. So there is a hopeful scenario that we, we do paint, which, which we call the new renaissance, wherein the United States and um, leadership um, bolstered by an American public that wants so, uh, global solutions, we do pick up that mantle, we do lead alongside our allies and partners, we do work with China to address a host of questions on the medical front, i.e. the public health front, the economic front, the economic recovery front, I should say, uh, and in a variety of other ways in order to not only lift all the boats of all of the major three um, sort of poles of the world, which are the East Asian and, and Chinese pole, the European pole, and the, and the North American or U.S. pole, but the rest of the world, too, including the global south. And so we do paint a very hopeful scenario. But in, in order for that to happen, that will require 
leadership from the United States. I, there is no substitute for the United States still in this world that we inhabit. Um, and and I, we, we think that um, there is a way out of this, but um, it's going to require some vision. It's going to require some willingness to engage. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess, again, going back to what we started the, this conversation with, the question is, is the United States prepared to do that? It's an excellent question, uh, and I guess we it's to be continued. Uh, but we enjoyed having this conversation. Uh, Peter, Peter Engelke, thank you very much. Thank you both. I appreciate you having me on.